The House Education Committee will come to order. Will the clerk please take attendance? Chair Here. Thank you. Representative Church's moves to, um, to approve the minutes of the June 13th meeting without objection so ordered. Do I do have some numbers now? And uh, Representative Stone moves to excuse absent members. The Senate Committee on Education is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Chairwoman Polanke. Minutes from June 13th, so approved by Vice Chair Geis. Hearing no objection, the minutes are adopted. Okay, um, we will now take testimony on House Bill 4820, Representative Skaggs. You can come on up and the floor will be yours. For the Senate side, members today were meeting to hear discussion related to House Bill 4820 introduced by Representative Skaggs. <clears throat> Although the bill is referred to the House Committee and we aren't able to vote on it at this time, Chair Colazar and I wanted everyone to hear more about this bill. With that, Chair Colazar, I'll hand it up to you. We had Okay, the House Education Committee, Committee will come back to order. Representative Skaggs, the floor is yours. Apologies, Chair. 
Good morning, representatives and senators. Thanks to Chair Colasar and Paul Hankey for allowing me to testify today on House Bill 4820. House Bill 4820 is the product of listening. Before I was even sworn in as a state representative, and especially since the para bills were introduced, I've listened to the thoughts and concerns of the entire education community. I've listened to teachers who were frustrated by a sense of hopelessness rooted in the fact that they had little or no say over their classroom placement. I've listened to seasoned teachers, friends and neighbors, who remember when they were young professionals in the teaching field. They told me that it would be a mistake to go back to the placement system of bid and bump, where teachers lined up in the gym or the cafeteria, and new teachers watched as their desired classes were gobbled up. I listened to school administrators who made the case that a seniority-based placement system would lead to unnecessary inefficiencies. I listened to administrators who told me they were ready for a system and systemic change where teachers had a seat at the table and were brought back into the decision-making process. I listened and I remembered. I remember when I was an educator, I worked with my provost and my chair in a collaborative manner to devise which classes faculty in my department would teach. Sometimes I got what I wanted, no 8 a.m. classes. Sometimes I didn't. I never did get to teach that great class on 1930s Soviet movie musicals. Would have been wonderful, trust me. I'm the product of a public education system. I spent my entire life within it. My mother was a teacher. My father was a public university professor. I sent my two daughters to public schools where they thrived. I believe in public schools. And I believe that public schools are at their best when the adults act as part of a collaborative educational community, which is always focused on what's best for students. This bill, along with the para reforms, seeks to return us to that collaborative approach where everyone, teachers, principals, and superintendents are involved in an open and transparent process that places the proper teacher in the right classroom so that our students have the best opportunity for success. I know teachers, principals, and superintendents, and I trust that they are all there for the betterment of our students. That's why House Bill 4820 eliminates ill-conceived and misapplied state mandates and gives our educators the opportunity to build a framework that works for them in their district, while ensuring that the outcome of these talks does not end in a seniority-only based system, a system that no one that I talk to is interested in implementing. The bill simply states that teacher placement, layoff, or recall decisions cannot be based solely on the length of service of a teacher. Educators in each and every school district will have the opportunity to devise their own placement, layoff, and recall decision based on objective measures that they agree to, such as effectiveness in the classroom, time spent in a certain grade level, or familiarity with certain subject areas. The recreation of this collaborative system is not going to be easy. I've read the cards in opposition to this bill. I know change is hard. Giving up power and authority is hard. It's difficult. But we cannot build a system where everyone has a seat at the table, where everyone feels that they have dignity, where everyone has a say in where they are placed without making these hard changes. In addition, by passing this bill, we can retain younger teachers at a time when we know that we have a problem with teacher development and teacher retention. We can do this by giving our younger teachers a voice in their school 
so they can feel confident that every effort was made to place them in a classroom where they belong, in a classroom with the students that are the best fit for their skills. Thank you again, chairs, for allowing me to testify on House Bill 4820. Should the chairs wish, I am available for questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm going to start. Oh, can you guys hear me OK? Uh, thank you for your testimony, Representative. Uh, question for you. It seems like when you describe your bill, you're talking a lot about local control. So is your bill meant to really return these negotiations, these conversations, back to the local units? Yes, Chair Colasar. Maybe I didn't repeat myself often enough in the testimony, but absolutely like the, uh, the goal here is that I believe, and uh, the bill certainly allows for uh, each school district through discussions to devise the system that works best for them about how to place uh, layoff and recall teachers. So this is a bill um, that returns that local control while at the same time ensuring that the outcome of that system doesn't devolve into something that no one that I have talked to wants, which is a seniority-based only bid and bump system. Okay, thank you, Senator. Oh. Thank you, can everyone hear me? Thank you, Representative Skaggs. I'm gonna preempt um, I, probably the next uh, testifier or two because I've read the, the memo in written testimony that they've sent and in the letter, it intimates that your bill, House Bill 4820, ignores individual teacher performance. But in my reading of the bill, um, especially on page four, it says, seniority cannot be the sole factor in filling vacancies, placement, layoff, or the elimination of a position. And it offers, I quote, any relevant factors may be used for personnel decisions, including but not limited to effective ratings, number one, effective ratings on teachers' performance evaluations. Number two, experience in terms of length of service in a grade level or subject area. Number three, relevant special training other than professional development or, or teachers will know what sketchies are. Think a master's degree. Number four, as otherwise collectively bargained. I see these relevant factors as more comprehensive than the BB factors from BBV Hazlitt in 1976. Uh, that ruling was used to discharge a tenured teacher for poor performance in, in the 70s. The BB factors contain things like uh, knowledge of subject area, efficacy, classroom management, rapport with parents and teachers. Those are all covered in a teacher's evaluation. And the last BB factor, there are five, says physical and mental ability to withstand the strain of teaching I don't even know how that's legal. <laughs> so I think the BB factors are outdated. I think that uh, the factors listed in your bill are better. They're more comprehensive. So unless I'm reading this wrong, I kind of, I, I reject the notion that uh, individual teacher performance is not reflected in your bill. Do you have commentary on that? I don't know that I could have said it better myself, okay. Senator, um, but of course this bill does look at the performance evaluation system that's also created in section 1249. Um, and I agree that the BB factors come from a, uh, an actually overturned uh, appeals court decision which was really a series of yes or no questions that was supposed to be based on, on um, and the answers to which would be based on a individual's, um, whether or not an individual was reasonably uh, terminated. 
Um, it was never meant to be a system where teachers were compared to one another for placement, layoff, or recall. Um, and obviously the factors are extraordinarily uh, broad and subjective uh, and open to almost any kind of possible determination. Um, my hope as, as, as you state, Senator, is that in these collaborative talks uh, between the parties involved, we will be able, they will be able to come with, with, um, with decisions to measure effectiveness in an objective way. Uh, to help them determine uh, the best place meant for teachers and um, the best system of layoff and recall. Thank you. One thing I, I would like to note, um, when Governor Snyder was governor, this is when the BB factors were uh, in section 1248 one, were inserted into um, uh, um, the performance evaluation system so and tenure so the BB factors in the past in the Snyder administration in 2011 and I think again in 2015 with the passage of section 1249 were used but they were used for completely different reasons in the first case it would be um, tenure and in the second case it would be teacher evaluations. I just kind of think that we're throwing these BB factors around sort of willy-nilly to fit where we want them to fit uh, when in fact the the factors in your bill are far more comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you. And also, I just as we uh, we have questions from other uh, representatives and senators, just want to make a note that at 9:45, the Senate ha does have a hard stop for their side of the committee because they have to get to session. So, just want to make sure we're aware of that as we go along. Uh, next up, we have Representative Paquette. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for your testimony, Representative. Um, I, I like how you mentioned about one of the goals you have is retaining newer teachers. It's one of mine as well. We lose teachers most between three and five years of teaching and they go into other professions and leave the field unfortunately um, uh, in this uh, you know, those individuals in my estimation you know the only way to make more money in teaching is to work longer years and so when a teacher who's teaching between three to five years they're making half of some of their colleagues already why is it that with the the data point out there that 90 some 97 percent of teachers are rated effective you know, this cements the fact that now these teachers who are already making half are going to be placed in the worst placements. Why, why is it that you're pushing for that, I guess, in this legislation? Oh, I think this legislation has the exact opposite effect. Um, by not allowing seniority to be the sole basis, it opens it up to um, discussions uh, that are devised at the local level to determine effectiveness, to look at where are, what certifications, what qualifications do, do teachers have? And I believe that superintendents, teachers, and principals will be able to come up with a system that does exactly, I think, what, what you're pointing to. If a teacher is remarkably effective at a young part of their career, um, they will be able to, uh, based on a system uh, negotiated in talks, have that ability to be in the proper classroom. So I think that the goal here is to make sure that we don't have that bit and bump system, um, but to allow a more collaborative approach to placement, which I think will benefit younger teachers. I think and it will benefit all teachers. With a follow up and with the, the fact that, you know, 97 some percent are, are rated you know, effective and, you know, uh, Chair Plank, you mentioned that you know a lot of the teachers that are in there to make more money, they have to get their sketches, get master's degrees. I did that as well um, to, to get paid more, but I was still making half of some of my colleagues because I had just worked less years. So and making and ensuring that these individuals and in seniority, as it says here in uh, page three, it's the tiebreaker, it could be the tiebreaker, um, or it does not prevent it, but that's gonna be the consideration, plus that effectiveness. All the teachers are already rated effective right now, even though we're dropping in our education scores as a state. So that pretty much cements the fact that these teachers are 
going to be put in the worst placement and exacerbate the fact that they're probably going to leave the profession. I, I just am very concerned about that. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Callan. Thank you, Chairs. Thank you, Representative. When we look at, um, again, the need to keep teachers, young teachers, and, and all, all level of teachers as best we can, what do you see as the long-term benefits with this bill that would help that? I think you mentioned it a little bit just now, teacher placement being, allowing them to be where their skills are best used, but long-term benefits, are there others? I mean, I think the long-term benefit is in, is in the placement in the classes where they want to be, that the job that they have is the job that they are qualified for, um, and so that job satisfaction goes up. As far as Rep. Paquette's question about compensation, that's, that's not a part of this bill. Um, this bill is about simply about placement, layoff, and recall. So I think that the way that we will see the retention of our young, qualified, enthusiastic teachers is because they will have the opportunity, increased opportunity, um, to both have a voice in where they are um, and where they are placed. And in many districts, they already have that voice. This will cement that that voice uh, is, is listened to. It's not going to be listened to all the time, as I said in my own example, um, but it will give them the voice to talk about what classroom they want to go into. Um, they will um, then have the job satisfaction of trying to be in the classroom that is most appropriate for them and that is most, uh, that they are most qualified for and are most effective in. Also, thank you for reiterating that salary is not a part of this bill. Um, next up, Senator DeMoose. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> You know, I know you spoke to so many people and listened to so many people, but I'm surprised that I'm having a hard time understanding how you came up through those conversations with the idea that literally, unlike every other industry on earth, including our own, where we're measured every two or four years based on our performance, how you came up with the conclusion that performance and effectiveness is not the best determinant of personnel decisions. And you need to help me understand why seniority even matters at all. I heard a lot of the things um, that you say, a lot of things that we all agree on, like believing in public schools, giving young teachers a voice, helping foster a collaborative approach, and so many other things. But this bill does expand the importance of seniority. Why and how specifically does considering seniority actually help any of those things? I think that what this bill tries to do is, uh, as, as Representative Colasar uh, emphasized, uh, place the decision making on these three factors uh, with the local school district. And that's what I listened to and that's what I heard. So yes, we are eliminating some of the state-imposed restrictions on, uh, on school districts so that we can build this collaborative process, which will take into effect um, evaluation systems and teacher effectiveness. Um, but we'll also look at when the factors, when there's a tiebreaker for all things in consideration, uh, about education level, effectiveness, qualifications, or whatever criteria the school district comes up with, um, that seniority is the, is the criteria um, that breaks those ties if all things are equal. But it explicitly says, because this is what I heard, it explicitly says that everyone in the educational community and the bill itself does not want a system where the outcomes of the collaborative negotiation that take place ends in a, a length of service only system. Um, Representative Wagella. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Representative, for your testimony. Uh, first, I just want to acknowledge, I, I, we keep using this word seniority, when I think the correct word is experience. Uh, and I, I bring that up because no one in their right mind when they're selecting an auto mechanic is going to prefer someone who's been working on cars one year versus 10 or a doctor who's been in the field for 20 years versus two, right? I, I think that's like a logical conclusion. Um, now, that's not the, the, the end all be all, um, but I just think we, we get caught up in this that seniority is bad, but I, I, 
experience is good. Um, that being said, uh, on page four, line 17 and 18, it says length of service in a grade level or subject area. My question and suggestion is just maybe changing the word subject area to content area, and my reasoning for that is, uh, and I, I think that the spirit and the intent of the bill is so that we're not moving social studies teachers to English classrooms or math teachers to science classrooms, uh, but specifically I feel like subject area is a little loose. Does that mean like if I taught uh, American history or U.S. history one year and world history next year, am I, am I not gaining experience in the field of social studies education? Um, just something for us to consider as we move forward. I, I think content area might be more in the spirit of what the bill is trying to get to. I was curious your thoughts on that or if that's something you would consider. It's certainly something that I would consider. I'd be happy to talk about it more. Representative Green. Thank you. Um, thank you for being here, Representative Skaggs. Uh, it's always tough to go in front of a panel like this. Um, so whenever we're modifying, adding to, or in uh, repealing a lot of language, I always ask what's the potential impact on the quality of education for children, and are they receiving and um, that they're receiving and what are they what are the anticipated improved outcomes for the students you say um, that this has been a collaborative approach but then you also said that giving up uh, power and authority is hard so I ask what is the role of the manager in this plate in this because it, it's repealed a lot how do you believe that this change will benefit the students in terms of ensuring that they have access to the most effective and qualified teachers and those teachers are put in the right classroom because isn't the role of the manager who has that 10,000 foot view um, to be able to, to determine that? And from what I've read, it seems like that we hamstring the superintendents and the managers in this bill. Well, thank you, Representative. I think that's a good question that really gets to some of the, the root of the issues that we're trying to talk about here. Um, how do we devise a system where we are making sure that everyone at the table has a voice, but we're also making sure that teachers are placed in the most effective way. Um, you could certainly devise a system where you have all authority uh, in the hands of principals and superintendents, but what is the outcome of that um, for teacher effectiveness, for job satisfaction, for teacher retention? I think we have to keep multiple factors um, in our minds here. I believe, and we have done this in the past, that, we can, that the school districts can devise a system where the superintendent is bringing that, where the principals are bringing that 10,000 view overall you know, we need to have these classes, we only have so many teachers with these qualifications, that they will bring that to the table um, and will work on ways to devise uh, a system that they will work in. Um, so I think that, that this is, again, going to be difficult to move from a, a more sometimes at least allows for a more one-sided system and to move to a more balanced system. But I trust that everyone can, can do that while keeping these broad factors in, uh, in play. Thank you. Um, Representative Churches. Um, thank you. Um, so I'm just, I'm, I'm just kind of reflecting. As a teacher, I taught for 10 and a half years. Um, six of those years, I requested to move out of my position as a fifth grade teacher. I am a certified science teacher. I was never granted the opportunity to teach middle school science, something that I always wanted to do. So a potential outcome of um, how it would impact students would be have a teacher, potentially like me, who has passion for a subject area teaching those kids. I, I would be very invested and care very much about meeting the needs of my learners if I was doing something that I went to school for and got a special endorsement to get, but I was successful at teaching fifth grade and there was a need for me to teach fifth grade, so I was kept in fifth grade. Um, seniority, 
or experience is very important, right? It, it gives us the tools that we need to be successful to teach our colleagues and to collaborate together. Um, but if we look at this from a different perspective, teachers are expected to teach kids, students, and meet the needs of their learners and develop individualized learning plans to meet the needs of each of those kids. Um, to do that, you need to often give kids choice because that's what they are interested in. If you tell every kid to do the same thing on the same topic, you're not gonna get as much engagement. I wonder if this bill strives to look at the needs of educators, look at the interests of educators, and give educators choice over their profession and give them a voice into what they teach and how they teach, do you think that this strives to take into account um, professional aspirations of teachers and tries to restore respect to these educators? Thank you. Um, Representative Markkinen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, wonderful testimony. Thank you for this morning. Um, how many layoffs have we had recently in the last couple of years in school districts across the state that would drive this bill forward? Layoffs of teachers? Oh, that's, that's, that's beyond my knowledge. What's driving this bill um, is a sense of exactly what Representative Church has uh, mentioned um, and exactly what Representative Green mentioned is to try to, to create or recreate a system on placement, layoff, and recall um, that balances the needs of the district as the superintendent and principal are looking at the big picture with the desires of the individual educators um, to be in a classroom that they most uh, believe they can be the most effective at. So what drives this um, is not number of layoffs. Um, what drives this is a desire to recreate a system um, of dignity and collaboration uh, between everyone in our school districts. Thank you. Also, we do have two other groups wishing to testify, so I'm gonna take two more questions from members and then we are going to allow our uh, people to testify before the Senate has to leave. So next up is Senator Johnson. Thank you, I'm too short. Thank you, I appreciate it. Um, I'm a past educator and there's an array of abilities just like any other job or profession with teachers. And I think the biggest difference under this bill than what we have right now, that it allows seniority to be a major factor that currently cannot be used in the law. Performance will no longer uh, have to be a major factor when making decisions about layoffs, retention, and, and other decisions. That is the big difference in this bill. And my question always, and I've served on education in the House and in the Senate, and um, being a past educator, teacher effectiveness for our kids. Our kids are what we're supposed to be talking about. We talk a lot about people that are getting paid, but we have not prioritized our kids. The effectiveness for our kids is my number one goal and always has been. And um, I guess my question is, since we've talked all about other people, how will this bill help our kids directly to get a good education, which Michigan struggles to do? Thank you, Senator. Uh, I believe, as I said in my testimony, I think that the system that I hope that this bill um, helps to, to regenerate um, is a system that always keeps what's in the best interests of our students in mind. Um, I don't think that the only system that can do that is a system where, um, where total authority lies with, with the administration. So I think the difference between, uh, between my bill, um, 4820, uh, and how 1248 looks at the moment um, is that we're not doing away with teacher effectiveness as a criteria. 
we're doing away with the state mandate that the teacher effectiveness be um, be described in a certain way. Um, I certainly hope that school districts will be looking at creative ways to be able to define uh, teacher effectiveness and will come together to, to create a system um, that focuses on the ways that a teacher is best at in which classroom um, they are most effective at, at making sure that our children get the best education possible. I, I believe um, throughout all the conversations that I have that that is the overriding goal of everyone in the system. Thank you, and I think it's also important to point out that the evaluation system that teachers undergo is incredibly rigorous and thorough, especially in those first five years before they achieve a tenure status. I mean, if I would argue that when we worry about the effectiveness of teachers, you, got, you have five full years to, to see if this person is somebody you want to keep in your district, so it's always important to point that out too. And your bill very much is still returning that control to the locals because no two school districts are the same. And I think that's an important thing to point out. Representative Glanville. Uh, my question's been answered, thank you. Okay, with that, I do wanna make sure we have time because we are running out of it. So uh, I wanna welcome up, uh, um, first of all, thank you, Rep Skaggs, appreciate thank it. Thank you, Chairs, thank you, Senators. Thank um, you, I wanna welcome up uh, wishing to speak and supporting the bill, Tammy Danzer from the Michigan Education Association. Good morning. First, I want to clarify our position on House Bill 4820. Ideally, we would prefer that all matters pertaining to teacher placement be bargained at the local level. That being said, we understand and we appreciate the need to collaborate with all stakeholders about these important decisions pertaining to public education. House Bill 4820 is a result of such collaboration and therefore we do support this bill. We listened to the concerns expressed around returning teacher placement to a mandatory subject of bargaining. We recognized there was a fear that local bargains would result in a seniority only based bump and bid procedure that could potentially displace new teachers to the profession. To address that concern, House Bill 4820 modifies language in section 1248 of the revised school code to intentionally prevent any use of a bid bump procedure to determine teacher placement. We heard the desire to have any method of teacher placement be based on multiple factors, not just seniority alone. As a result, House Bill 4820 provides that seniority may not be the sole factor in teacher placement decisions and requires multiple relevant factors be bargained at the local level. We also took note of the need we heard from educators to have opportunities for movement within the education system. If a teacher desires to move grade levels or subject areas, they should have a thorough understanding of the procedures to effectively facilitate that movement. As a result, House Bill 4820 requires clear and transparent procedures subject to collective bargaining for all personnel decisions. We feel this bill effectively represents the work that has been done to intentionally meet the needs and objections to return teacher placement as a mandatory subject of bargaining. Do you have any questions? Okay, thank you very much. We're gonna make sure we have time to hear both testifiers. Thank you. Um, so next up we have from the Michigan Association of School Boards, Jennifer Smith. Sorry, one hand, it takes me a second. Also, I hope you're starting to feel better. <laughs> I'm getting better at being left-handed. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and committee for this opportunity to testify on 4820. I am Jennifer Smith, Director of Government Relations for the Michigan Association of School Boards. And I appreciate the opportunity to explain our opposition to House Bill 4820. We've also turned in a memo from a group of education organizations, as well as a legal memo from the Troon Law Firm. We highly encourage you to read that memo as it will help explain what this truly means at our district level for our teachers, students, and districts. While this bill appears to address concerns raised about seniority being used as the sole factor in teacher placement and layoff and recall, it does not solve that problem and instead creates new ones related to layoffs specifically. 
MASB has consistently opposed placement and layoff and recall being included in the bill to repeal prohibited subjects of bargaining. And with this bill, it elevates our concerns with House Bill 4354. This bill does not just speak to seniority, but changes the definition of teacher and removes factors to be considered when doing layoffs that were established by the Michigan Supreme Court in the case BB versus Heslick Public Schools in the late 1970s. Since the 70s, districts have been required to consider a teacher's performance, including skills, knowledge, classroom management, and pedagogical skill when doing layoffs. This ensured that our best, most effective teachers were retained in the classroom with our students, ensuring their success. As the Senator stated earlier, this bill instead looks at evaluation rating, length of service, and special training. These things, especially your evaluation rating and special training, are appropriate and important, but they are not a replacement for the well-established and understood BB factors. We also know that our evaluation system needs work, and we look forward to doing that work with this body. However, until that work is done to make that system more fair, this bill could force districts to base teacher placement in part on state test data. The bigger picture and ability of a teacher should be used instead. Also, since the 70s, this bill has covered any licensed teacher in the district. Sorry, the current law has covered any licensed teacher in this district. This bill removes that because it changes the definition of teacher to classroom teacher. This would mean teachers serving in other capacities in our district would not be protected by Section 1248 any longer when considering layoff and recall. We urge further and more consideration of this bill. It is too complicated an issue to rush through in this single hearing. We fully support not returning to seniority-based systems, as we've stated before, but this bill will not accomplish that. It still allows seniority to be a primary determining factor, while harming teachers who are not in the classroom but serving the district in other capacities and removing protections for our best educators. We strongly urge a no vote on this bill, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Senator Paul Hank. Being no further business and without objection, the Senate Committee on Education is now adjourned. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. The House is sticking around, so um, with that, and especially in the interest of time for their session, um, I quickly would like to move along to taking up testimony on Senate Bill 359, introduced by Senator Chang. So uh, once she's able to get around the, the desk area here, uh, Senator Chang, you will be up. Hello. Uh, thank you, Chairman Colesar, for taking this bill up today and appreciate you making it a priority to uh, take this up before summer break. Uh, this bill seeks to address an inconsistency in the law where all educators across the state are able to collectively bargain on certain topics except for educators in the Detroit Public Schools Community District hired after 2019. Back in 2016, the Michigan legislature enacted Public Act 192, which amended the revised school code to include community districts. As a refresher, this act essentially transferred the work and employees of the previous Detroit Public Schools to the new community district, Detroit Public Schools Community District. Teachers and school administrators who were hired after September 1, 2019, in the district must establish a compensation method that focuses on the job performance and achievements of a teacher or school administrator. The job performance is evaluated by a yearly annual evaluation. The law currently states that the community district may not use the length of service or achievement of an advanced degree as a factor in compensation levels or adjustments in compensation for teachers hired after September 1, 2019, with only two exceptions. My bill, Senate Bill 359, is very simple in that it will give educators in the Detroit Public Schools Community District back the ability to collectively bargain regarding compensation method in a way that ensures that a teacher who has many years of service or has achieved an advanced degree is able to receive greater compensation just like they would be able to in other school districts. Opponents will make arguments about job performance being the priority when it comes to considering how much we pay teachers, and of course that is a top consideration, and this bill does not change that. However, it is imperative that Detroit's hardworking educators be given the respect that they deserve 
for the years of service they give to our children during the ups and downs for our city and school district with a student population that has an enormous amount of need. I'll reiterate that this bill is very simple and that it just makes sure that Detroit educators are treated the same as educators across the state when it comes to collectively bargaining about compensation. And you'll hear next from Janelle Mansfield of the American Federation of Teachers, although I'm happy to answer questions. Any questions from members? Representative Weiss. Thank you, Senator Chang. Um, as a former DPSCD teacher um, and DFT member, I really appreciate you bringing this bill forward. I know there's been a lot of discuss, discussions already today about concerns about younger teachers leaving the profession. Um, in your mind, how will this bill help prevent that from happening in DPSCD? Yeah, so um, it's a great question. So, so I should have mentioned, uh, I have a daughter who's in DPSCD. Uh, she's only had two years so far, but the first year uh, she had a brand new teacher in DPSCD. Um, second year she had um, a, a veteran teacher who had been there for many, many years. Um, and I'm someone who wants to make sure that we're able to keep that really good qualified, uh, you know, overperforming uh, teacher that she had that first year who was brand new to the district. Um, but one of the concerns that we have is if we don't take, if, if Detroit public schools community district teachers aren't able to uh, collectively bargain and can take into consideration years of service, um, that puts new teachers at a disadvantage, especially knowing um, all the challenges that they face as new teachers in Detroit, which you probably remember. Uh, and uh, just especially thinking about some of the new teachers who start it, uh, you know, during COVID or whatever. Uh, there's there's just so many uh, factors that that should be considered, and right now, years of service is not considered at all. Um, and it, to me, it also is just really a basic issue of fairness. You know, Detroit teachers deserve the same respect as as teachers across the whole state. Thank you, Representative Paquette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Could you just give a rundown as to why this tool was taken away in the first place from Detroit Public Schools? Just a little history as to you know, why this bill is necessary. Sure, and Janelle can help me out here a little bit, but so in 2016, uh, the legislature voted to create the Detroit Public Schools Community District. It was at the time when uh, the former DPS uh, was struggling uh, financially, and so, uh, it was a decision of the legislature at the time to create this new community school district. Uh, the legislature looked different than it does now, and it was the decision of the lawmakers at that time uh, to, as they were creating this uh, new school district, um, to, uh, yeah, that poll, <laughs> the, anyway, the poll is not in a great place with that microphone. Um, it was a decision of the legislature at that time to, uh, again, prohibit Detroit teachers from being able to collectively bargain on this topic, but uh, I, I, many of us voted no on that. It's something that I disagreed with at the time and, and am eager to fix uh, very soon. Yes, and just to add that the initial bill package was bipartisan and had support from both sides of the aisle, and the amendment came in at a last minute effort, literally late at night, um, to uh, admit it that Detroit teachers could not bargain after 2019. So it wasn't a part of the entire package in the first place to consolidate the district with the debt as DPS and the new district born into DPSCD. So, yes. Thank you. Uh, Representative Green. So, thank you for the history on that, and that was my question. So, ha had, is all the debt paid off from the Detroit Public School? And then do you think that the new district is heading down a different financial path than the one that was previous? Um, because we, we just would not want the same pickle again. So as of right now, I was a department head in the district. And under the new leadership the past five years, we have made great strides in paying off the debt um, through, DPS, through DPS. And currently, we have a balanced budget that remains in the black where we see a surplus and we have had some issues with the lack of ARPA funds and all just the systemic disenfranchisement and disinvestment in education over the last few decades. So I think the district is doing the best it can with the resources that it has. Thank you. Thank you. And also, would you say without this bill that there's definitely a barrier to entry for new teachers to be motivated to want to come to DPSCD? Absolutely. When we look at districts that neighbor us such as Dearborn where their step three is $53,000 
and my step one might be 51 and I might never move from there, contingent on all these factors that I have no control over, I think it definitely deters our, te our teachers to go to outside districts and or charter schools in the area. Thank you. Okay, we, I appreciate your testimony. We, now we're reading cards, or do we have more? No. Oh, sorry, Representative Weiss. Just really fast, because I, I just wanted to point out on that question too, that um, that debt for DPS was run up under state management when the district was under state management. And also there are several districts across the state that are dealing with some pretty major legacy debt, um, but only DPS CD has this restriction on their collective bargaining. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Um, cards to be read in. Uh, not wishing to speak, supporting the bill. Todd Tennis from AFT Michigan. Not wishing to speak, supporting the bill. Bob Kefchen, MASSP. Not wishing to speak, opposing the bill. Molly Masick, Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Not wishing to speak, supporting the bill. Jennifer Smith, Michigan Association of School Boards. Not wishing to speak, supporting the bill. Matt Schuler, MASA. And with that, um, I need a motion to report Senate Bill 359 with recommendation. Representative Weiss makes that motion. Will the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to report, Chair Colazar. Yes. Representative Churches. Yes. Shannon. Yes. Stone. Yes. Weiss. Yes. Glanville. Yes. Conlin. Yes. Edwards. Yes. Wagella. Yes. Green. No. Martin. No. Paquette. No. Wenzel. No. Johnson. No. Thank you. Uh, now I need a motion to re-refer House Bill 4319 to the Higher Education Committee and Representative Weiss makes that motion. Will the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to refer, Chair Colazar. Yes. Representatives Churches. Yes. Shannon. Yes. Stone. Yes. Weiss. Yes. Glanville. Yes. Conlin. Yes. Edwards. Yes. Wagella. Yes. Green. We're, sorry, we're re-referring House Bill 4319 to the Higher Education Committee. Yes. Markinen. I'll be louder. Paquette. Oh. Wenzel. Yes. Johnson. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 14 yeas, zero nays, zero passes. House Bill 4319 is referred to the Committee on Higher Education. Thank you, and I should know better. I didn't have my coffee. I'll be louder. <laughs> Uh, the next um, next thing is I need a motion to re refer to refer House Bill 4816 to the Higher Education Committee and Representative Glanville makes that motion. Will the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to refer, Chair Colazar. Yes. Representatives Churches. Yes. Shannon. Yes. Stone. Yes. Weiss. Yes. Glanville. Yes. Conlon. Yes. Edwards. Yes. Wagella. Yes. Green. Yes. Martin. Yes. Kev. Yes. Wenzel. Yes. Thank you. And now I want to return to House Bill 4820 and read in cards that were dropped while we had our original testimony. Um, first of all, not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Joe DeVault from Macomb ISD. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Bob Kefchen, MASSP. Not wishing to speak supporting the bill, Todd Tennis, AFT Michigan. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Bob McCann, K-12 Alliance. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Peter Spadafore from MASO. Not wishing to speak um, opposing the bill, Dave Randalls, Oakland Schools. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, bill Mike Latvis, Wayne Risa. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Dave Cox from Northern Michigan Schools Legislative Association. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Jerry Johnson, Calhoun ISD. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, John, I hope I get this right, Severson. Um, Michigan Association of Intermediate School Administrators. Uh, not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Mal Molly Masick from Mackinac Center for Public Policy. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Matt Schuler, MASA. Not wishing to speak opposing the bill, Beth Deshone from the Great Lakes Education Project. Okay. Um, next, I need a, I, we have a substitute that I will be introducing uh, really quick. This substitute just breaks a tie bar with some evaluations bills. Uh, and, and has this one as a standalone. I need a motion to adopt that substitute. Uh, Representative Weitz makes that motion. Uh, will the clerk please take the roll? On motion to adopt the substitute, Chair Holzar. Yes. Representative Churches. Yes. Shannon. Yes. Stone. Yes. Weitz. Yes. Glanville. Yes. Conlin. Yes. Edwards. Yes. Wagella. Yes. Green. Pass. Bartman. Pass. Paquette. Yes. Wenzel. Yes. Yes. Mr. Chair, you have 12 yeas, zero nays, two passes. Substitute H1 is adopted. 
Thank you. And now I need a motion to report House Bill 4820 with recommendation. Representative Churches makes that motion. Will the clerk please take the roll? On the motion to report, Chair Colazar. Yes. Representative Churches. Yes. Shannon. Yes. Stone. Yes. Weiss. Yes. Glanville. Yes. Conlin. Yes. Edwards. Yes. Wagella. Yes. Green. No. Markman. No. Okay. No. Wenzel. No. Johnson. No. This tree of nine yeas, five nays, zero passes. House Bill 4820 is reported for recommendation as substituted. Thank you. And there being no absent members, um, there being no further business before the committee, the committee will stand adjourned. Thank you, everyone.